pray for rain. If anybody can help us out and do a rain dance, that would be greatly appreciated. Resolve yourself to know there will never be enough of it. It won't be enough to really impact the fire or slow it down. Tonight on Denver 7 News at 6, an in-depth look at wildfires in Colorado past, present, and future. Everybody here knows you know, at least two, three, four families who don't have a home and are displaced. Plus, a Colorado congressman's district looks to become much more competitive. But it's going to be a lot tougher of a campaign. And leave the car, grab the catalytic converter. Five grand worth of damages to not have a single lead, a single anything on it. You know, the, the thieves can just do their thing. Well, good evening. We're glad you're with us tonight. I'm Shannon Ogden. I'm Anne Trujillo, and you can taste the smoke when you walk out the door, even yeah. here in the metro. Six wildfires are burning tonight in Colorado. Others have already burned out, and there are likely dozens more to come. Now, the west slope really is getting at the worst. That deep shade of maroon means exceptional drought, and there's no more severe category. And there is no more severe sight than this. A hotshot team took this video of a fire NATO out by the Utah border, and we are grateful to say no homes are in danger. Now, the effects of drought are on full display in Eagle County for sure. From the sky, you'll see these plumes of smoke. Underneath, you'll find 200 firefighters guzzling Gatorade, forming perimeters and holding the line. Deborah Sevens Lance Hernandez begins tonight's team coverage from the Sylvan Fire. The Sylvan Fire began last weekend. Fire Command believes it was triggered by lightning. It has consumed 3,752 acres so far. A Sikorsky helicopter heading toward water to fill up and fight the Sylvan fire, burning near Sylvan Lake State Park. I'm very concerned because it can change very rapidly. Cindy Skolan, very concerned about the wind. She is among numerous residents of Eagle who have been told to prepare in case. I haven't quite done a to-go bag yet, but I know exactly what I'm taking and where it is. I think I don't want to do it yet because it makes it too real. The skies were dark earlier today. There was lightning and thunder and a little bit of rain. Firefighters want more rain, less wind. Winds have, have, have been the driving factor in most of this. Um, the, the fire behavior that we've seen, the direction that the fire has moved, has been less terrain driven and more wind driven. This is what it looked like from Air Tracker 7 earlier this week. Tracy LeClaire with the Rocky Mountain Type 1 Incident Management Team says the erratic fire forced the closure of Sylvan Lake State Park and the evacuation of nearby Fulford. Pre-evacuation orders have been given to residents on both the Pitkin and Eagle County sides of the fire. Just to let them know, uh, be ready, be, be aware, gather those important papers, your pets, your prescriptions, all of those things that are irreplaceable uh, and make sure you're, you're ready to go at a moment's notice. LeClaire says their fear is that this could be another summer like last year. We are in uh, anywhere from uh, extreme to exceptional drought. And uh, un unless we get some, some decent rain, uh, the forecast for the coming summer is unfortunately more the same. Lance Hernandez, Denver 7. There are two other fires we're especially keeping an eye on tonight. One's the Muddy Slide Fire that's a few miles outside Kremlin. 4,000 acres have burned and a handful of people still out of their homes tonight. And so far, there's no word of any buildings lost there. The Oil Springs Fire is the other one we're watching. This is about 20 miles south of Rangeley. 11,000 acres already have burned. Evacuations and road closures remain in effect. And you can add Vail to the list of communities not shooting off fireworks for the 4th of July. Eagles, Steamboat Springs, Aspen, Telluride, and Boulder have all canceled because of drought conditions. And Denver isn't doing its Independence Eve show either, though Elitch Gardens is still putting on a show. Now, if it feels like fires are starting earlier and staying around longer, well, it's because they are. Four months of fires used to be the norm, and these days, a six to eight is more common. In fact, in 2019, the U.S. Forest Service said it no longer prepares for fire seasons, but for fire years. For some perspective on this, our chief meteorologist, Mike Nelson. Mike? Well, Shannon and Ann, it is entirely connected to our warming world from climate change. In the last 50 years, we've seen hotter summers across Colorado and Denver. We have 15 more days on average above 95 degrees than we had back in 1970. Hotter and drier 
equates to more big fires. Now there's some other parts of this that go in the, the urban encroachment into the areas as well as fire management over the last hundred years. But the fact is it gets hotter, drier, you get more big fires. The climate change connection is clear from the shrinking Arctic ice, the intensity of tropical systems, heat waves and droughts, and the record setting wildfires. We've seen our carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels and that carbon dioxide acts like a feather in a down comforter trapping heat that would otherwise radiate into space. You can learn a lot more in a short amount of time with my new book, The World's Littlest Book on Climate, which is available from Amazon.com. Here's a little bit of good news. Cooler for this weekend with more showers and storms. I want to show you what it's going to do to the wildfire smoke. This is the current map across the country. Over the next couple of days, we're going to see less smoke in our skies. And with any luck, more of the showers and thunderstorms across the state. I'll have the full seven day forecast coming up in about 10 minutes. Of course, no town knows the danger of wildfires like Grand Lake. Half a year after the East Troublesome Fire, they are still rebuilding and sharing their stories with Denver 7. Here's Jason Grenauer. Get out, get out, it's here. Uh, I have a party at 396 County Road 644. The flames moved faster than anyone could have thought. We never ever expected 6,000 acres per hour. Negative, we have two parties trapped up in that area that are sitting in the middle of the road. 150,000 acres in 36 hours. Who imagined it would take out a whole neighborhood in 20 minutes? Leaving scenes like this throughout the outskirts of the town of Grand Lake. Everybody here knows, you know, at least two, three, four families who don't have a home and are displaced. Months later, this community is recovering. Between the support of the community and just how people rallied behind all the fire victims and just the way the whole town, the whole county came together, it's like we can't leave this. They are rebuilding. Everyone is pitching in and trying to bring each other up. We're actually more rooted here than ever, and we don't have a house. And I'm happy to camp. You know, we, we're, we're here. We're more here than we ever have been. While still remembering what happened. Troublesome Stories is a way to be able to show not only the images of the fire itself, but the artifacts that relate to the loss. And, and it's profound. I'm really looking for items that have depth and meaning to them personally. You know, um, this teacup is the perfect example. It's a piece of wedding china, you know, from her wedding many, many years ago. The next step is to restore Grand Lake to what it was and what it will be. With the return of visitors this summer. They are welcome. That we want them here. That um, visitors are a a huge part of our recovery. A small town like the sun off the lake itself, reflecting and taking steps to move forward. It is still a small town, community place, and you know, it's... Um... And when the rubber hit the road, <laughs> Grand Lake stepped up yep. and, and showed what this town is made yeah. of. What a true community is all about. That was just a small sample of the emotional and heartfelt interviews that our team has gathered from Grand Lake. If you'd like to see more, we have a full 30-minute documentary on Grand Lake's recovery titled Burn Scars right here on Denver 7 Plus. Just hit your, hit your back button in order to find it. And of course, we have in-depth coverage on all angles of this story up right now on the DenverChannel.com. Funeral services will be held Tuesday for Arvada Police Officer Gordon Beasley. Family, police, and guests will be allowed inside. Everybody else has to watch through a live stream. And we're going to have that up and running for you on Denver 7 Plus, as well as on the DenverChannel.com. Services begin at 10 a.m. The young woman who murdered her 7-year-old nephew in 2018 has been sentenced to seven years in youth services. Jenny Bunsom was 16 years old when she smothered Jordan Vong and stowed his body in a closet of their Montbello home. Prosecutors say Bunsom killed Vong after he became upset that she wouldn't play video games with him. Five of Colorado's seven U.S. representatives should have little trouble hanging on to their congressional seats under the newly proposed district maps. Now, a sixth, Lauren Bolbert, is trading Pueblo for some of the bluer mountain towns, but most importantly, she's keeping the Western Slope base at 
put her in office. Now, it's the seventh district that's raising some eyebrows. Ed Perlmutter, a Democrat, has represented the seventh since 2006. And this new map doesn't kick him out, but it welcomes a whole lot of new people in. Here to elaborate is MSU Denver Political Science Chair Rob Prue. Seventh congressional district's really that big change. Uh, it's dramatic. Uh, bringing that down into the southern suburbs uh, really changes uh, Ed Perlmutter, who's the, who's the incumbent, uh, won with you know, over 20% of the vote percentage points in 2020. Uh, and he's now going to face a district with about a three percentage point advantage for Republicans. So uh, he has an incumbency advantage. He's a moderate. Uh, he may be able to still keep that seat, but it's going to be a lot tougher of a campaign. All right, so let's widen the scope a bit. Say a Republican represents District 7 and the newly formed District 8 goes to a Democrat. So that means Colorado would send four Democrats and four Republicans to Capitol Hill. But is Colorado evenly split? And what does this mean for the balance of power in Washington? Here's Rob again. And you know, whether this is reflective of, of what is really a blue state uh, with about a 14 percentage point win for Biden and, and a state legislature and, and statewide offices that are all held by uh, Democrats. Um, but the big fight really is at that national level. I mean, you're looking at Democrats currently uh, about a 10 seat margin uh, in terms of their majority uh, and every seat that they could possibly lose is certainly a concern uh, for them uh, and an opportunity for Republicans to you know, take control in, in what will likely be uh, a red wave uh, election. Now, the maps are subject to change and they must be finalized by December. Don't know what a catalytic converter does? Trust us, you will know once it's gone. It's super loud, like crazy loud. That story after the break. Normally a forecast for cool wet weather the weekend wouldn't be welcome, but I think you're gonna like to hear what I have to say for this one.